For years, outdated science has shaped how we think about a water for coffee. And here's the catch, even though we know better now and might still be holding back both your filtered coffee and espresso. And no matter how much you spend on your gear, this overlooked factor could be the difference between a world-class coffee or a flat, boring and nasty brew. In this video, I'll break down the myths around ideal water recipes and give you a much simpler and more realistic way to understand coffee water. And once this really clicks inside your head, you'll see coffee water in a completely different light forever. For a long, long time, the Specialty Coffee Association has recommended that coffee water should have 40 ppm of bicarbonate. When you dive into the water guidelines, this recommendation stands out because it's quite a bit more rigid than the ranges they typically provide for other water parameters. Bicarbonate is what balances how you perceive acidity from your coffee, so it's a pretty big deal. Too much gives you a flat and boring cup, and if you have too little, then you can get a sharp and hollow cup. For magnesium and calcium, for example, the SCA suggests a pretty wide range of acceptable values, but when it comes to bicarbonates, the stance is pretty clear. 40 ppm is the best. If you search around online for water recommendations, you'll probably find a table like this, and then you'll probably find some other boxes that kind of build on this recommendation. But the problem is that this info is outdated, and actually SCA knows it's outdated, but they don't do anything about it. Now, I know this might sound a little bit controversial, but just let me show you the proof. Let's first move on to exhibit A, and it will become pretty clear why that 40 ppm recommendation is quite unreasonable. When you say, I use 40 ppm in my coffee water, then it might sound very precise, but 40 ppm actually means 40 parts per million, which can also be translated to 40 milligrams per liter. So it's actually a unit of concentration. Think of it like speed. If you're driving 60 miles per hour for 30 minutes, then you're only driving 30 miles, not 60. It's the same way 40 ppm in different volumes of water means different total amounts of bicarbonate. Now, let's look at these two glasses here and see why this might be problematic. In this one big carafe here, I have my pour over coffee. I use 20 grams of coffee here and 300 milliliters of water. In the other smaller cup, I have my espresso. So again, I use 20 grams of coffee, but this time I only use 60 grams of water. To make it easy, let's say I have a standard 20% extraction of each. So I'm going to take four grams of instant coffee and that will represent the total extracted coffee. Next, I'll add my water, which contains the bicarbonates. But remember that 40 ppm is actually 40 milligrams per liter and I'm only using 300 milliliters of water. So that's less than a third. So my 40 milligrams per liter becomes 12 milligrams of bicarbonate. So I'll add 12 milligrams of bicarbonate to the extracted coffee. And I will do it here with jelly beans to symbolize bicarbonate. Now for my 60 milliliters of espresso, I have a lot less water. So I'll do the math again. There are 40 milligrams of bicarbonate in one liter of water. My espresso shot is only 60 milliliters, which is a tiny part out of a liter. So I'll do the math again, and that gives me 2.4 milligrams of bicarbonate in the espresso. So I add around two and a half. The other one goes in here. So even though both of these drinks are brewed with water containing 40 ppm of bicarbonates, they very clearly don't contain the same amount of bicarbonates. And now the question is, which one of these two will taste more acidic? The one with 12 jelly beans versus the one with 2.4? I think the answer is pretty clear. Remember, we have the same amount of coffee in each uh, cup and carafe, and coffee makes uh, water more acidic, it makes the pH level go down, but the bicarbonate can fight against that. I'll put my money on the 12 beans worth of bicarbonate. So, if you ever had espresso that was tasting too sour or acidic, or filter coffee that was tasting flat and boring, the chances are that this right here is a good explanation. Now, you might be thinking, if this is so important, then what are the professionals in the industry doing? Well, I'm glad you asked, because if you look at the bicarbonate levels in more recent commercial products, especially aimed at pour over coffee, for example, Apex Lab and uh, Aquacoat, they have extremely low bicarbonate levels. They are so low that they can't be measured with a standard titration test kit. So probably under 15 or even 10 ppm. Then there's the third wave water. Interestingly, their recipe doesn't include any bicarbonate at all. 
Instead, they use uh, calcium citrate, which has a buffering effect similar to bicarbonate. If you translate the effect uh, chemically, it's equivalent to about 40 ppm of bicarbonate. But many lightroom drinkers actually cut third wave water in half, meaning they use half the powder for the same amount of water. And that effectively brings the bicarbonate level down to around 20 ppm. And I was actually curious about this, so I ran a poll here on YouTube. And 49% of people who watch this channel use uh, third wave water when it's uh, watered down to around half strength or even less. When we look at the most popular DIY home recipes over the recent years, holy water has probably emerged as the most recommended one. And that recipe also has a low bicarbonate level of uh, 22.5 ppm. There are also many well-known coffee roasters, for instance, uh, Coffee Collective, uh, Gardelli, April, La Capra. And they are all pretty open about recommending a very, very soft water for their filter coffee. Say Coffee, the famous roaster from New York, actually has their own mineral recipe. And they recommend 15 ppm of carbonate hardness in that recipe. So again, a lot less than 40 ppm. And an important disclaimer here, I'm not saying that ultra low bicarbonates is always the best for filter coffee. It really depends on the roaster and the brewing method. So you'll have to do some experimentation and find out what works for you. But if the roaster is open with this information, then you can just ask them. Now let's get back to the jelly beans again. There's another side of the coin that I think deserves just as much attention. Because one thing is just talking about a certain bicarbonate level. But I think you can and should go much deeper because bicarbonates never just exist by itself. It always comes with something else in regular tap water. A lot of it mainly comes from calcium carbonate. So that means whether you have a high or low level of bicarbonates, by default you'll also have some calcium as part of that package, which is a completely different discussion. But what if you make your own customized water at home? In that case, it's very popular to use something like sodium bicarbonate, aka baking soda. Then your bicarbonate would come with sodium instead of calcium. So let's take a look at how that could look in jelly beans. Or another common solution could be to use potassium bicarbonate, and for that, I would add some of these blue jelly beans here instead to represent the potassium. So is it a coincidence that I have blue jelly beans for potassium bicarbonate and red jelly beans for sodium bicarbonate? Not quite. I've been doing a bunch of taste tests recently since I started working on my water course. And I've come to realize that these two types of bicarbonate really add something different to the cup. If you want to go really deep with all this, then I'll put a link to my water course down below. That course is 28 videos, so of course I can go into a lot more details than I can here on YouTube. And I discuss all the minerals, tools, special techniques that you need to optimize your water. And I'm running a 20% discount for a short time if you use the link down below. But if you just want the TLDR, then I find that potassium bicarbonate is more neutral and cool at smaller doses before it becomes more and more bitter, almost like tonic water. Whereas sodium bicarbonate, on the other hand, it adds more sweetness, more depth, and it's more warm, so to speak, in small doses. And when you use too much, it becomes astringent and kind of muddy and overpowering. So that's why it, this is the red jelly bean and potassium bicarbonate is the blue jelly bean. So it's kind of like cold versus warm. So let's say I want to make a water for espresso. In that case, I'll probably increase the bicarbonate to balance the acidity. And instead of just relying on other sodium or potassium, I'll probably combine them so I don't get too much of one of them. And instead, I get the balance with the positives of each. For example, if I'm making a Pavlis water, which is a famous recipe for espresso, then I change the original recipe a bit and get one third of my bicarbonate from baking soda so I can reduce the bitterness and enhance the sweetness. So to get back to the official recommendations, 40 ppm of bicarbonate, where does this idea really come from? I've been looking through a lot of old papers and while I can't find any definitive proof, I think somewhere around 15 years ago, the Specialty Coffee Association decided that it was a decent compromise that works okay for filter, okay for espresso and best of all it also protects the espresso machine against corrosion and reduces scale so it's kind of a compromise value but is it also the best for any brewing methods no i'm not really so sure and the crazy thing is that the specialty coffee association uh, actually agrees here in 2018 they released a water handbook where they actually say outright that different brewing methods and different roasting styles call for different levels of alkalinity. 
but you have to buy that PDF for 45 US dollars. And on the website, they don't have any new tables that show an updated range of values that can work for different types of coffee. And actually, it's really hard to find any mentions of water specs on SCA's website in general. In the cupping guidelines, they do have some recommendations, but here they suggest a range between 40 to 75 ppm of alkalinity for cupping. And if what we've been discussing today is accurate, then the range for that type of coffee brewing should be lower rather than higher. I'm not saying all this to point fingers at the, the SCA, but when they previously had a guideline that so much was built on in terms of recipes and graphic material and really everything out in the public domain, then I think they should do a bit more to guide the community back in the right direction. Imagine that the World Health Organization knew that the daily recommended intake of protein had been wrong for years, then you'd want them to do something about it, maybe publish a new infographic, maybe uh, put on a press conference or something like that. So that's it for today. I'll see you in another coffee video very soon or perhaps in a coffee course. So check out that link below for more information if you really want to take your coffee water to the next level.